outside of that, it's in the middle of all the other African countries, and its nickname is, do you know the nickname of Malawi? The Warm Heart of Africa. Okay, give me that. I was going to try to, to trick you on that one. Great. Did you find it warm? It was warm, yeah. <laughs> it was uh, warm and humid, okay. and uh, cool. the what people were friendly. What did you have to make now? When you, uh, you leave home, you leave the comforts and stuff, what adjustments did you have to make while you were there? Everything. But I mean, like, the big, the big things were trying to find food. Everything was different about eating over there. They don't have processed food, really, like you do in America. I could go buy a whole meal out of a freezer here in America. But in Malawi, I bought all raw ingredients, basically. And if I wanted processed food, like tomato sauce for my spaghetti or something, I would have to cut the tomatoes and then cut the onions and then start making a sauce. New talents, new chef. Yeah. I thought I knew how to cook until I got over there, and then I was like, what? Interesting. Uh, hey, I did, the, also I was kind of interested to know, besides spending Sabbath school time with Pete and me, what else did you miss while you, while, while you were over there? Um, I think there's, there's a lot of predictability about life in America. Um, you wake up and you know what the road is going to look like and you know that there's not going to be a pig or a chicken or something in the road and you know that your car is going to work probably and you know there's like these givens that are incorporated into life if nothing else Starbucks coffee is going to taste the same <laughs> but nothing happened how it was supposed to in Malawi and I didn't didn't always like that. So I missed the predictability, I think, was one of the biggest things. And people. Cool. Yeah. So that's got to be a. Um, Milk asked you about an adjustment. So, in any of this process, whether you were uh, making, just getting used to just the difference there, were there any moments when you thought, uh oh, what have I done? Oh. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have come here. And then, and then, follow up, if you had those moments, how did you get through them? Yeah, I had those moments all the time. <laughs> it's impossible uh, not to live in the part of Malawi we were in and have not have those moments. I talked to all the other missionaries um, who shared my same questions. And... Um, I think one of the biggest ways that I kind of got over that or got through those moments were I started reading this book called The Irresistible Revolution by Shane Claiborne, I think his name is. And it was a, a lot about living among the poor and finding beauty and routine and something extraordinary in the ordinary parts of life. And that's really where I started finding more meaning in what I was doing. I'm, I'm sure that uh, when the, the word student missionary came up, you had these expectations, or maybe you didn't, but you know, I remember they said, hey Milch, you wanna be a student missionary? And I said, uh, no, because <laughs> I had these certain expectations of Malawi life. And, uh, but maybe you had expectations, but you know, when you went over there, what were your responsibilities and did they match your expectations? Is it, is it what you thought it was going to be when you got there? Um, yes and no. Like, uh, we drove from the airport to the place we were living and it was just this blur of everything being new and like 46 hours of travel time behind you. But. Driving through there, I just saw mud huts and people selling like goats that had been butchered on the side of the road and like true poverty, just trash everywhere. And I was like, whoa, this is like coming to Africa. It's the real deal now. Um, and so that, that was a lot like what I was expecting. And then the responsibilities, there. The responsibilities were a little different. All I was told was that I'd be homeschooling 
in a, uh, teaching kids in a homeschool type environment. And so naturally I thought Malawian kids, but that wasn't the case. So I taught a bunch of kids because Malawi has more NGOs, non-governmental organizations than any other country in the world. Um, in order to keep those things going, there has to be education for the kids of the workers. Otherwise they're gonna leave. So my responsibility was to teach their kids and some of them were doctors' kids, and some of them were ADRA workers' kids, and some of them were, one of them was a random business dude's kid from the Blantyre world, but that's beside the point. So Brennan shared briefly that he now has a lot more appreciation for his uh, professors, and he thinks uh, they will like him a lot better now once he goes back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was not a question, that was a statement. Here's a question. What was a Sabbath experience like? Okay. Um, it was terrible. <laughs> it was really bad. I really missed church here um, and church at Walla Walla. And going to church there was crazy. Um, their first service was at 8 in the morning. And that's like a whole nother theological problem, but they had a second service that I went to that was at 11. And it was really interesting. It's like the sermon every week was beating people over the head about some sort of salvation by works topic that wasn't particularly appealing to me if you want to go on a consumer-based religion type of model, and I, uh, the singing was a problem too, big time. There's like hymn number uh, 692, the couple before the doxology, the Lord is in his holy temple. I mean, it's a very easy melody, but somehow those five notes that are exactly the same in a row were not exactly the same note. But they're the same in the hymnal, so there was all sorts of singing intricacies that I had to learn while I was over there, and the, yeah, lots of pomp and circumstance associated with church, which was a little not what I was used to. So, keeping in the same kind of uh, the same kind of theme, the Sabbath and God. Has your prayer experience changed or been modified as a result of your time there? Yeah, definitely. And how so? Um, I used to think prayer was sort of like an activity or an isolated event, but over there I started living more like prayer was just a lifestyle. It's just kind of what you do all the time because you don't know how things are going to go. It gets kind of scary sometimes. So I prayed a lot more. And some of it really wasn't like bow your head and close your eyes kind of thing. It was more just like, all right, let's do this kind of thing. Emphasis on the plural. So um, how did your experience from start to finish um, affect your faith in God, if at all? It's different. Um, like I said, I thought I was going to be doing something that felt a lot more significant than what I was doing on a daily basis. People argue with me that what I was doing really was significant, but I'm still in that phase of thinking. Maybe it wasn't so significant. Um, so I was kind of mad at God about that, kind of frustrated, like, hey, what's this whole missionary thing about if you're not really doing what you thought you were going to be doing? But um, after I got over that, I, the interaction that God has in daily life or the role that he plays actively in daily life, um, which was really easy to see over there, was a big deal. And that I sort of shifted my um, belief structure or something to be more aware of that and less concerned about the fact that I wasn't doing what I thought I was doing or that one isolated event that went wrong. 
what, was there something that was uh, that surprised you about the people of Malawi? Yeah, they're super hardworking. My goodness, like. 4.30 in the morning till 4.30 in the afternoon, they are doing physical labor without any question, and they take a lot of pride in what they do, which is cool. If it's like sweeping the same jacaranda leaves or flowers or whatever that fall every day into the same pile and the wind blows them back and they sweep it the next morning, they're proud that they swept that that morning. It's a big deal to them, and they think it's significant. Which I suppose it is. It keeps them employed and food for the family. So, um, but that was one thing: is how hardworking they were and humble about it. So that was cool. So I noticed uh, you lost a little weight while you were over there. <laughs> but I want to know, and you've spoken a little bit to this already. What have, what did you gain? Um. Just to clear it up, I left it about 135 pounds, which was already pretty thin. By mid to late October, early November, I was down to like 120 pounds, which puts me at a BMI of like 17 for you medical people out there. I was pretty thin. Um, what did I gain? I gained all sorts of things. Um, a newfound patience. Whoa, I was a really impatient person, and I still am in a lot of ways. but. That whole unpredictability thing makes you wait for a lot of things. So I learned to wait and be happy about waiting. And it was fun. What else are you going to do? You're not that important. So that was one thing I gained. And a wor new world perspective, just understanding a totally different way of life. Uh, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs really made new sense to me, um, where food and shelter are really the fundamental things and these things that we talk about in America, like job satisfaction and a uh, intricate sense of community, really don't mean as much. Um, what, it sounds like you did a number of things besides just count carcasses on the road or you know a variety of things. But is there something that, that sticks out to you as extremely meaningful that you did while you were there? The most meaningful thing that you did? Um, so we taught some like 12 and 13 year old boys and it's an interesting phase of life. I remember being 12 or 13 and a boy and it's rather awkward Sorry to you 12 or 13 year old boys out there. Um, and so I got to sort of push them around a little bit and help them become men. Um, and that was rewarding. I mean, it seems so trivial, but just this, I, they had maybe inactive parents or a different sort of social model in their home since everybody in our class was from a different culture. Um, so sort of pushing them to do that. And then there were really cool things that I got to do with the locals. Um, I would make a pot of their local food called Encima, which is like this corn. I, t I talked about it before. That's one of the few things I knew about Malawi before I left. I think I told you guys about it. Um, but after eating it and cooking it and becoming pretty friendly with Encima, it's interesting stuff. They take corn and they refine it like four times so it's like white flour and then they boil it in water and make like paste, corn sticky goo thing. And then they make patties out of it and then they roll it into a ball and they put it in the back of their throat and they swallow it. They don't chew it. You can't, it's like mush and it's gross. It has no nutritional value and it's really sad because these just like what most of these people eat. And they eat it with relish, which is usually like cabbage and tomatoes that have been boiled with a ton of salt. And that's their food. But I would make that and I'd go eat with people on the streets who were begging. So they had like eye problems so they couldn't work or they had mangled limbs so they couldn't work. And there was always a kid who would escort these people. So there was food for the kid, food for them. And I'd just sit with them on the sidewalk or wherever we would be and share some food. 
and it was hot, and I assume it tasted good to them. I thought it was gross, but I ate it anyways. And I got to name that kid. I think Pete read to you guys about that, but that was pretty, pretty cool. Right, some uh, parents gave Brennan the honor of naming their baby because he had taken a special interest in the couple and trying to provide some uh, supplemental income for them. So imagine being asked to name a couple's uh, baby. Yeah. So he, he, he mentioned that in a, one of his uh, blog entries and, and how he responded to that initially, which was, I, I don't want to name, that's a lot of pressure. But then you embraced it. Yeah. Started thinking about it, I was like, all right. It's one of those things you probably shouldn't say no to. So I yeah, got behind it and came up with the name. Uh, his dad's name was Shadrach, so I liked the name Meshach. I thought it was a manly man name. And his last name was Lacunda, so I thought it. Meshach Lacunda, that's what I named him. I liked it, and his family liked it, so that's all that matters. Excellent. So in one of your last that I was aware of blog entries, you used the word providence. So I just want to, and you, you alluded to it there, so, but how, looking back now, how, what's one example of how you can see God's providence at work? Um, when it was time to go, um, things kind of got sorted out in our favor, and that was really cool. Um, we were probably if not on the brink of depression, both depressed. Um, the guy was there with and myself, and it was a very frustrating and unfulfilling time. And um, we basically got kicked out of the country. So. Because of a visa issue? Yeah, he had a. I had gotten my work permit, but he had not gotten his work permit, so he was living there on tourist visas, and the chief immigration officer said, hey, you better get out of the country before we come after you and kick you out. So he said, you have three weeks to get out. And so we got on the email and said, hey, we have three weeks to get out of this country. And boom, there was a ticket. So I think God really knew that we needed out and that we had accomplished what we had gone to accomplish. We finished most of the curriculum. Um, some of the students were entirely done, and a s couple of them still had a few chapters to go. So we made lesson plans and gave the teacher, uh, the parents, the teacher keys and stuff like that. Cool. Well, listen, uh, Brennan, we're we're thankful that you know we have this opportunity for you to share this chapter in in your life story with us. And it, I think if you remember, we, we dismissed you from our presence with a prayer. And what we'd like to do is, is welcome you home with a prayer, too. That's okay. And if there are uh, other student missionaries, we'd like you to join us just for a moment. We want to pray with Brennan and welcome him home. Um, and so if you've been a student missionary, you kind of uh, know the experience, please come up here and, and join us. As, as we uh, praise God and, in prayer and welcome Brennan home. Come stand behind Brennan here. Look at that. Other student missionaries. I was chicken. <laughs> <laughs> or listening to Brennan's story, I might have been smart. I don't know. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of Brennan, Amen. for his dedication, his service, for all the student missionaries who have uh, given of their, their talents and lives in your cause. We understand that... Uh, these journeys uh, have bumps and hills and roadblocks, but we're grateful that 
with your guidance that Brennan's chapter of student missionary was successful, that he's returned, and that through your grace, his life, his words, his actions in another part of the world will live forever. Thank you, God, for bringing him home. In Christ's name, amen. amen.